Okay, train dispatching, a lot of evolution there. The first train dispatcher, there was no CTC, okay? Prior to 1928, there was no CTC. So everything was done on paper. You know, the train sheets, train orders, all the things for crews and locomotives, everything was all done by hand, hand transcribed. And so that was a lot of work. There was a lot more dispatchers because it was a lot of work. And so how did that evolve? Okay, well, here comes CTC, 1928, right? Well, they didn't put CTC all over the railroads until 1928. That was the first installation. The CTC really got got cooking in the 30s and into the 40s. And uh, then, you know, and even continues today. But this is a CTC board here. You can see he's dispatching, you know, probably 100 miles of railroad. And he's looking at a chart recorder there at the bottom, uh, which is giving him a train graph of the trains moving across the territory. They don't have the train numbers, but he, he can figure out what train it is there. And he can track what time and the progress and so forth. But so this reduced a lot of the CTC by itself, you know, reduced the workload because now trains are running on single indication. They don't need a, a clearance card with right, right over uh, train orders anymore, you know, has right over from point A to point B. This, now signals are run, trains are running on single indication. So dispatching job just got a whole lot easier uh, with CTC. So um, then in the 70s, 60s and the 70s, now, and we'll talk about radios here in a minute, but that was a big game changer that the dispatchers can now talk to the trains. You know, they didn't have to go through the towers and the depot operators. They could talk to the trains. They could code in the trains. And the boards changed a little bit. Now they have, now they have uh, they're up on the wall and um, the, the dispatcher probably has more territory than what he had before because he's, uh, he's got some tools there. Just started to get some uh, computerization too. And some of the things were computerized. The train she sheets into the 70s uh, were computerized and slowly uh, things were computerized. Uh, this is a shot of the rear projection there systems. And by that time with these rear projection system, you know, this would have been in the 90s. You started to have some really good tools for the real productivity tools for the dispatchers. You started to have the movement planners. You started to have the meat pass planners. Uh, you had auto routing, uh, a lot of things, tools there that the dispatcher's getting that allows him to him or her to do something else. And the train sheets were electronic uh, all by that time. And the uh, managing of the locomotives and the crews was all done, was all on CRT. So all of these things all started to come together, huge efforts by a lot of people there to do all of this, to put it all at their fingertips, a lot more information at their fingertips, uh, more accurate information uh, to let them better manage, to be proactive the way they wanted to manage their railroads. And uh, I'll talk about rear projection here in a minute. That was kind of a, a flash in the pan because uh, the last dispatchers now are no longer rear projection. And this is a current picture taken right here of the NS dispatching in Atlanta using CRTs the, uh, the development of the flat screen, real, uh, the high res flat screen really helped and is a much better situation than trying to use, use the rear projection. The rear projection is okay, but the flat screen, high res flat screen, rear projection, uh, flat, flat screen, um, high resolution is really what you've gone to today. It lets you have all your information at your fingertips uh, in a modern dispatch center. They use headphones now to cut down on the noise. Uh, so it's a quiet place a lot. Uh, there's noise reduction uh, techniques there with the siding and a lot, uh, or the, 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 the stuff on the wall, the ceilings. A lot of things have been done to make it a more user-friendly environment for train dispatching today. And, and they get a lot more things done. So I mentioned some of these already. Auto routers, meat pass planner, movement planner. Those were all computer type developments that really helped, you know, take the load off the dispatcher so he could do other things, so he could do more planning himself on other things. Because the computer was doing the routing of the trains. You didn't have to worry about lining up every, every signal along the way. You know, that was all baked into what kind of train is it? Passenger train, intermodal. The movement, movement planner knew all that. The difference between a meat pass planner and the movement planner is the meat pass planner was just on a small territory. The movement planner takes into account uh, adjacent territories. So 
it really looks at what's going on in the terminal that you know how can i take a train off of off a territory through a terminal and get it to the next terminal okay and the movement planner does that does the figuring on that to try to optimize uh, for spacing for uh, pasting of trains all the things that you need to do to not get the terminals all clogged up with trains uh, and, and try to move them through there efficiently. The movement planner is a tool that helps you do that. Uh, mixed in there was the crew management, crew management, and locomotive management, all part of that same equation. You have to make sure you got crews called at the right time. Don't call them too early. Don't call them too late. Got to make sure you got motive power and the motive power is inspected on its proper schedule. All the things that they have to take into account. So having the dispatch centers consolidated. Uh, help do that on a system basis. CSX did that and, and all the others except NS. NS is the only one that didn't do a system dispatch center. Uh, helped you, it facilitated all these things that, that have happened to, to make dispatching more uh, efficient and let them be proactive in their planning uh, so they could uh, move the trains through quicker for which translate into better service for the customer. Um, another thing that was done is hardening the facilities. If you're going to Consolidate everything into one center. You better make darn sure, you know, the thing is not going to go down. And so, a lot of things were done to harden the facility. What does that mean? Hardening the facility means putting in a UPS system, putting in a generator, uh, building it. In the case of Jacksonville, building it in a bunker so it's hurricane per impervious. Things like that. Uh, hardening the dispatch system itself. Okay, hot standby, backup systems. Okay, that you'd have. You're not going to go down just with a single component going to have to be multiple things that, that are going to have to fail for you to fail. Hardening the network. Uh, the network is, of course, a big deal when you're down in Jacksonville or you're in Atlanta or Fort Worth or wherever you are and you're trying to control a signal or talk on a base station 900 miles away or 1500 miles away, you're relying on a network to get that information there. So you've got to have that network be able to carry it two different directions. You can't just have it one direction. You have to have some redundancy there. That you can wrap it around on your own circuits on the microwave or wrap it around on the telecom. So all of that was taken into consideration. And all the, 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 the radio systems that were built were all, have all been built, um, you know, I'm talking about the control system, have all been built with that same standard that, that it can quickly change routing. And uh, so all that was built in. And finally, um, the network, the disaster recovery that all these dispatch centers have a have a redundant place that, you know, if if something did get, you know, some other catastrophe happened, hurricane, tornado, whatever, flood, that they have another site that they could bring up quickly within within hours, not days, within hours, get the people out there, put them on a bus, get them out there, power it up. So all of your dispatch centers, Fort Worth, you know, has a backup center, and I don't know where it is. That's probably a secret, somebody's secret. I don't know where it is, but um, Atlanta's is uh, actually it's two of them, you know, 30 miles, 20, 20 miles apart in Atlanta. But um, so that was real important to have a disaster recovery center and procedures and people and staff figure out how you're going to do it. That's another thing we could talk all night on this stuff because it's really these are big subjects, but. System call center. So when you're you consolidating your dispatch, you have a defect detector help desk, you got a mechanical help desk, you got a customer service help desk, and a PTC help desk. You put them all together. Okay. So that was something else that came out of this in these dispatcher consolidations. You could do, and it's really made it a lot more efficient. Instead of having individual out on something going on out on each division for these, it's all done centrally. Okay. Enough about dispatching. Let's talk about um, a couple uh, train issues here. One is uh, why did we have the guys in the caboose? Well, part of their job we mentioned we talked about earlier that it was uh, hot watching for hot boxes. Well, another one was making sure the air pressure on the rear of the train was sufficient. It wasn't changing in a bad way that there was a problem in the airlines in the air uh, air system, or if there was some reason that they needed to shoot the air from the rear of the train, you know, they could do that. So, so what did we come up with when we, when we wanted to get rid of the caboose, we had to come up with something. We came up with the EOT. EOTs were a big, were a game changer, obviously. Florida East Coast used them in the 60s, but to use them on class ones in the 1980s meant that there had to be some things done to them to make them 
first of all, interoperable that you didn't have each railroad have its own design then you couldn't be interchanged. So that was one thing you had to do. And they were on different frequencies, by the way. One, NS used 160 and everybody else used 452. So that had to be consolidated. But you had to get interoperability with head HOT devices and the, and, and, and the head of train and the end of train devices, which they did. So they were kind of perfected. Uh, repeaters were put in all over. That's where the CNS department came in is we had to put repeaters all over the place. So these things could talk on, on long trains, especially at tunnels and places like that. We had to put them in, so we did. And uh, here's a change that came in um, 1997, okay? Almost 15 years after we started using EOTs, there were some accidents where they runaways on, on mountain grades and, and they, because there were, the EOTs were one-way devices. They, they sent the air pressure to the head end. There wasn't a way to dump the train on, wasn't a way to dump the air from the head end. So. In 1997, FRA made a rule all EOTs would have to be modified to be able to dump the air from the head end. And that was done. And there's the flow chart. If anybody cares, we won't take time to go through it now, but that was the FRA's flow chart. Basically, all trains that were running on the grades had to have a two way EOT. Okay, so railroad maintenance vehicle, everybody recognizes this as a motor car or speeder. Okay, that was used in the, you know, early versions with just a motor and no roof. And now then they evolved into what, what you see there. But starting in the 19, and these were used by Mainsway and Signal folks for doing their work, get on the track. Um, so this is what it evolved to, is the use of the trucks. Okay, the trucks now all high rails, a lot of features, anything you need to maintain is self-contained. Pretty much everything you got, you need to maintain is on that truck. And including like an inverter would be an example of things that are on there. And to get on and off the rail, there's even a push button there. You don't have to, you no longer have to get out and use the, you know, use the lever bar to crank the wheels up and down. You push a button to go get on the rail, push a button to get off. Gotta have track time before you get on the rail, obviously, but uh, that's the only thing it doesn't do for you. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, distributed power. Yeah, you had the steam engines uh, that would push up the grades wherever you were, sand patch, horseshoe curve. This one's at the Western Maryland Scenic. Okay, Local, uh, separate crew. He just pushes for all he's worth. He's not. He's not tied to the head end. He, he knows where he, he knows where he needs to have the throttle position going up the hill. Same thing with the guy on the Cajon Pass. I think that's where this is taken. Okay, there's a guy there. He's got power in the middle of the train. That's a man there doing that. So on the railway. Uh, you know, and I think other railroads too did this, but Southern Railway developed their own radio car in the 1960s that contained all the equipment to allow it to be MU'd to, another, to a unit in the middle of the train. So this was your first DPU, at least for Southern. I think CP might have done this too, but NS did, um, did, the, did a lot of research on this and um, used uh, 160 megahertz uh, transmitting to the head end. And, and, Certain locomotives, you, know, you didn't have the whole fleet to, to equip to do uh, from the from the head end. And of course, the radio car could talk to any of the units uh, through MU cable, but the head, the lead unit was a special unit, and you could look at a number plate had a white background instead of black. That meant it was a radio car equipped uh, lead engine uh, that could be a radio engine. Today, you see it everywhere. Everybody's using them. Uh, middle of the train, the locomotives are bought with that DPU capability using 452 megahertz. Um, you know, again, repeaters work, same kind of protocol as the other stuff, the EOT and the, and the um, remote control. So the repeaters work for that, um, but it's kind of universal. You can, you can put a locomotive on the end of a train and have it be a caboose too. So a lot of flexibility there has really been a game changer getting that DPU out there where every locomotive can do, or I don't, I say every, I don't know if every locomotive can, can do DPU, uh, if all the new ones can or not, and maybe there's some that can't. Somebody, I'm not a mechanical guy, some on this call probably know the answer to that, I don't. Um, so that, that's been a big game changer, obviously. And, and again, the CNS was involved because we did, uh, we did the repeaters for it. Okay, uh, motor car getting track time. When I started on the railroad, we had to use timetable and lineup, okay? And you had to be careful using it. You better be accurate in using it because the time you got to clear off the track using using the lineup, 
you better be off the track because you can get a motor car run over pretty quick. Not that I did, but, um, you know, I knew how I would learn quick how important it was, but that was how they did it. Time to look at the timetable, know the times the trains are supposed to be at the stations and that uh, the lineup would modify those times. And uh, that's, that was the way it was done early before, before track warrant. Okay, so now how far has it gone? And I'm not going through every step here to get there, but look at this one here. He's got this on his smartphone. He's got a track warrant form on his smartphone and he's getting a track authority, sitting in his truck, talking over the cell phone network. And he's gonna be, he's gonna get authority to work from point A to point B as a signal maintainer. Boy, have we made some progress. Don't have to bother the dispatcher to, to uh, this can all be done electronically. Um, Cuts down on everybody's workload, gets gets traffic off the radio, a lot of things this does, and it's a great. Uh, I haven't personally. I think Mr. Marbury, who's on this call, took this picture. Maybe he can fill us in on later. We won't take time right now. Maybe, but I think John John I think saw him how they do this. So, but it's uh, you know looks like it's a fantastic development. Uh, same story with movement authorities. Okay, timetable, train order, territory. Okay, hand up orders, movement authorities, tra train so and so has right over point A to point B on the clearance card, on the, you know, with a clearance card. And the hand up orders got the train order signal and stop position. This is a familiar picture everywhere. So that's how you move from point A to point B. Had to be done by dispatcher, it had to be handed up by a clerk, couldn't be handed up. Train crews couldn't write their own train orders. So it was a union issue too, okay. I had to have a guy, an operator in the depot or in the tower, in this case, Pullman Junction, okay. So here comes a game changer, okay. They uh, came up with the track warrant. Now this could be copied by a, tr guy, a train crew. You didn't need to have an operator, okay. Didn't need to have a guy in the depot. Didn't need to have a guy in the tower handing something up. Didn't be done over the radio. And it can be copied from a phone too, but um, you know, I think this really was kind of the thing that uh, on all the class ones, you know, they all adopted track warrants. Not, so not all exactly structured exactly the same, but same thing uh, that they do. Point A to point B, proceed from point A to point B. Done in the early eight, early 1980s, man, and that's kind of what one of the things that allowed the depot agents and Power operators to be done away with was the uh, evolution to the uh, track warrant from uh, from the train orders timetable train order operation flat switching operations we touch on that okay and the legacy you had to have a four or five man crew there a lot of times you'd have a guy riding the top of a box car that he's going to control that handbrake going down there so, you know, four or five guys, there's a fucking steam engine, it's probably five guys in the switching crew. Okay, guy on the top today, you're gonna still find some telltales out there, here and there. I've seen, I saw one a couple of years ago, they're still out there. They were used to warn that brakeman riding on top, you better get down, because here comes an overhead bridge. That's not a CNS item, I was just having fun here, with having a picture of that. <laughs> but here's what you do have, you've got the uh, belt pack, okay. Uh, remote control operations, RCL, remote control locomotive. The conductors have been trained to be locomotive engineers. Maybe a little bit controversial, okay? I don't think the DLA was particularly happy with that development, but um, it has resulted in the reduction of crews, okay? Two, two people, maybe three, can do it, but you know, you've reduced the crews and you've made it more efficient. The guy can uh, with run in the belt pack and stand there and and watch what he's doing. He can control it. He can make sure he's out of the way. Uh, he can do a lot of things. Of course, it requires training, and they built and they've been trained. But um, you know, it's been a great thing for the railroads. I think, from my from my point of view as a railroad guy, I know there's others that might not be quite as uh, you know supportive of it. But I, I certainly think it's been a great thing for the railroads. How did train crews communicate early on? Oh, there you go, hand signals, okay? Before there were radios, they could, you know, yeah, there was a signal for everything. Stop, slow down, go, everything. So um, that's how they communicated. Well, 
Frank Cruz, as I said earlier, they didn't really talk to the dispatchers a whole lot. They talked to tower operators. They talked to yard masters. But they didn't talk to the dispatcher a whole lot, I don't think. So once in a while, they came in on the side phone and called and talked to them, which is what you see here. So Pennsylvania uh, realized the need for that train. That moving train needs to be able to talk to, talk to somebody without stopping the train, without getting out and getting on that side phone stationary phone so they came up with the radio telephone that this is not a radio it's a, it's a tele, radio telephone in that it's electronic induction it doesn't use uh, rf per se it's an it's induction they used it this was in the late 40s just talking to towers it didn't talk to the dispatcher <laughs> but still it was a big it was a great development that they could you know a moving train could talk to somebody um you know trackside and required antennas on the locomotive and on the caboose, okay? That you could still find into the 60s, even though they had already gone to uh, VHF radios by that time. Okay, so then along came VHF radios in the 50s. And uh, now the dispatcher can talk to the train directly. So, you know, again, a big, big development. You know, you didn't need to go through the tower operator. You could save some time. You could be a lot more efficient by letting the dispatcher tone in and talk to uh, talk to the train crew directly. The radios starting out, handhelds, they were large and crude, is what you'd say about them. They were large, they were heavy, they didn't have very many features. The sound quality sometimes wasn't that great, but a lot better than hand signals anyway. Uh, they didn't have any of the features that you enjoy today on radios. And, and if you look at the list of features that you have on the new radios, it's hard to believe how much progress there's been in these radios and things that really help the train crews. The, la the one at the bottom of that list might be one of the biggest ones, the shoulder mic capability, that they can cr strap it to them on their vest and you know they can talk, you know, just have their hand right there, and press the mic without having to be holding a radio. Okay, they can do something else. So 99 channel capability, AAR channels, programmable, narrow band, and data capable, digital capable, I won't go into the details about FCC mandate, you know, to make it go from the band, wide band width down to narrow, but that was a that it led to some of these other things you see on the list. Big thing there is programmable too, that you didn't have to change out the crystals. They're lightweight. Locomotive radio, same story. They were mounted on the control stand. They were big and bulky and heavy. They were in the way. They had four channels. They were wide band analog log, and you know, you couldn't talk to another railroad. So if you try, if you had a foreign line locomotive come down, and I saw them all the time, I lived beside the tracks there in Columbus, and I saw the B&O use the SP engines come down the hill, and they had to use their handset to try to talk to all the tower operators. So obviously they couldn't talk very far. They had to wait till they got pretty close when they were using an SP engine uh, because you know the radios didn't have the right crystals in them. So what did the railroads do? They developed a clean cab radio, 99 channels, what you have today. And you think of all the things that that has helped, you know, all the things, foreign power on every other train has got a, if you're on NS, they have BN engines on every other train, okay, or UP. And I'm sure it's the same story on all the other foreign roads. So you have foreign engines, I've, you know, I've seen Faro Mexes come through, right? All these radios are interoperable. They all have 99 channels. The channels can be changed by the train crew. Um, gave rise to run through trains, okay? So foreign power, run through trains, Everything we do today, you know, was made possible. I'm not saying it was, this was the only thing, but this was one of the things that, that made it possible. All you see today with all the foreign power use there, whereas they, you know, all these, all these locomotives can all talk on everybody else's channels. And that was made possible by these radios. Clean cab radio. Okay, let's uh, talk about voice and data transmission. All that pole line there. Well, I said earlier, a lot of that's communication stuff, okay? What all rides on there? I mentioned some of the things, you know, phones and voice circuits and hot boxes and telephones and all kinds of stuff. Before we get into all that, let's just say, let's get this out of the way and talk about Western Union. They were on there too, uh, some, in some places. And depots became Western Union telegraph offices because the Western Union was on there. Western Union leased part of the pole line. So, you know, you get a telegraph. That's why you see Western Union signs on some of the old museum depots like this one in San Diego. But 
well, to get off that pole line, um, you know, you could go to the carrier, which we mentioned earlier, that carrier allowed, you know, two, I guess it's two pairs of wires could be made into 28 channels. That was a carrier. Okay, so that was help, but it was still pole line, right? So in the 1960s, railroads said, well, here's microwave technology, but wireless technology that can handle our baseband. It can handle all our voice and data, you know, 28 T1s on a, on a, on a baseband. So, uh, so that meant that you could put all you put your voice and data across this thing. Didn't have to rely on the telco anymore. Instead of having to rely on, you know, the telcos back at that time, I guess, I don't know, uh, wasn't the ones you have today, but uh, AT, today it's AT&T and Sprint. Um, but you put all your eggs in their basket and that's not a good situation. So railroads built their own microwave networks. You know, NS built, uh, with NS and NW together, you know, have 440 microwave stations that were all built in the 60s, and some of them, few of them in the 70s. So, uh, you know, that that handles all their critical communications for their code lines and their VHF voice and their telephones are all on the microwave network. So, you know, that was a big investment, but boy, is it paid dividends. They can put all the radio transmitters on these towers. You can see they're loaded up with antennas on there for their code lines and their voice radio are on there and now PTC is on these towers too. So it's really pay for itself. What else? Fiber optic starting in the eighties. Fiber optic started to get popular. Uh, tel the fiber optic companies wanted to bury on our right away because it was continuous right away. So what agreements were made. So what did the railroads do? Well, let us have a fiber in your cable and we'll let you be on our right away. Wow, was that a great deal. And we didn't do enough of them, in my opinion, but some railroads did do a lot of it, but NS didn't do enough of those deals. We did a few, but yeah, we could run, we could put some voice and data. Not that it would be our main one. I mean, basically just to back, we could run on in their cable, but that was with them. But also we buried some of our own fiber optic and uh, you know, we're using fiber optic up on the former Conrail lines today for control points and the VHF bases and the beauty of fiber optic is there's so much bandwidth there. It's a lot more bandwidth than fiber optic in a, in a fiber optic fiber than there is on a baseband on microwave. It's just a lots of lots of bandwidth available there. Fairly inexpensive equipment too. So how did we OS trains? Going way back. Okay, we OS them with operators when they were in the towers. Okay, here's one that, that I remember. And that's the dispatcher, the middle, what you see in the middle there, some of them on this call might know what that is. I don't really know the official name of it. I call it an encoder. There's probably another name for that device. But anyway, the dispatcher, uh, I was in the St. Paul Dispatch Center for, for Omaha in 1977 and saw the guy press the black button, then the white button, a black button, a white button, and a red button. <coughs> and that would do clunk, 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 clunk. clunk. And it would ring down to to a station. Well, at night they could have it ring down to the I think it was the Augusta Depot, and it would turn on a microphone. And that's what you see on the right was a microphone uh, there uh, that that was trackside. And so he'd open that circuit up when he was waiting for one of the trains to go by Augusta, and he could listen and wait for the train to go by, and then he'd OS the train by because he heard it go by, and then he'd come back and he'd clunk and shut it shut it off so it wasn't on anymore. But so it's called an the device is called enunciator. The, the the technique is called enunciator, even though I don't know the name of that middle device there that he used to to address. Not only that, but he could call any depot operator he wanted to uh, talk to. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the Rice Lake Depot, and we'd hear the buzz and and the operator there, Jack White, would say, "Wait a minute, the dispatcher's calling me." Okay, because we heard a buzz sound and our our bell ringer, and and that was the dispatcher. Uh, calling. So here's how we do it today. OS is baked into the CTC systems when they get on the track circuit. Okay, it uh, tells the back office, you know, train is there, so it's baked in. Telegraph started, everything was sent telegraph from, from early from day one. I think telegraph was invented, what, in 1851? Something like that. I think it was Erie Lagwana might have been, I think it was the first railroad that used it, telegraphs in the United States. So before the Civil War. So telegraphs were around from day one. 
for critical uh, data transmission, train orders. Um, and it wasn't until early 1900s that voice circuits started to come into play and telegraphs started to be replaced. It used Morse code. And I, I've read where Morse code was still used in some places in even into the 60s. Just because people liked to use it. They liked it because people couldn't eavesdrop on them. <laughs> Nobody knew more, not that many knew Morse code by that time. And, and some of the places were still uh, using it to talk to another uh, station. So the keys were there and the sounders were there. Um, but like I said, uh, voice came into play, uh, speakers, to, uh, speaker, dispatcher line, dispatcher party lines came into play and replaced the telegraph. And um, in today's office, uh, you know, it's voice, it's voice circuits, but it's also a lot of messages being sent, okay, electronically. And, um, you know, e even email is used at times, okay, so anything electronic. Uh, they, like I said, they use headphones to cut down on the on the amount of noise to keep them a quiet. They like to have a quiet environment. One one other game changer here that I've got in the right hand side of the slide is the use of the voice recorders, which again, like recording here, is important as anywhere. That everything is recorded. All the conversations are recorded. Um, telephone, radio. And, you know, those systems used to be unreliable. You know, they'd be real to real tapes. And now it's all done electronically. Uh, the retrieval is done quick and easy and the storage, storage is huge. You can store large amounts of it, but everything is recorded and it's really cut down on a lot of frivolous stuff. You know, anything you can think of, people making allegations, whatever, all that's been reduced greatly because everything is recorded. And so the recording systems have played a big role in dispatch centers in trying to uh, you know improve improve efficiency and not waste your time doing stuff that you know you used to spend a lot of time doing researching uh, i'm going to finish up here talking about this device some of you might know about because we're going to get into pcc our last slides are on ptc here um i think some on this call probably know what this device is and i'm sorry i can't get feedback here it'd be fun to be in an you know it'd be fun to be at the place where I could see you, guys, see you guys raise your hands and stuff, see who knows what this is. Uh, this is an inductor, for those of you that don't know, in automatic train stop territory that was used by a lot of railroads, including Santa Fe and CNNW. Um, so what did automatic train stop? This is intermittent train stop, which is different than continuous train stop. When a train would, uh, when a signal would downgrade from, you know, from clear to approach, uh, the inductor was there to make sure the engineer acknowledged it. So when that downgrade, when that signal would be displaying yellow, the signal system knew that that signal had been downgraded. And so when the train uh, went by there, uh, that the locomotive then had the logic in it so that that when the, when the inductor told the told the locomotive that that a downgrade had occurred, then the locomotive waited for the engineer to acknowledge it. And if the engineer did not acknowledge it, then uh, then the brakes were put on the train. So that was automatic train stop. And after 1953, when the FRA made rules that uh, that you 79 was going to be the new speed limit for passenger trains, I believe it was 53, the early 50s. Um, unless you had it uh, automatic train stop. Unless you had an intermittent uh, train stop was, was okay, was, would, would be in compliance. But if you didn't have automatic train stop, uh, you could only go 79. If you did have automatic train stop, you could go 90. And railroads like Southern, they decided that um, the, the incremental uh, difference between 79 and 90 was really not worth the extra cost of maintaining those inductors out there in the fact that you had to work around it with TNS gangs and the rest. So they were taken out um, start, starting sometime, I guess, in the 60s. Uh, they were taken out. And, and by the time I hired on the railroad in 1980, they were all gone. But uh, you could still see them on the circuit plans some places, but uh, they were taken out. I, uh, Santa Fe left them in. And I think today on Santa Fe, you could still find them out, you know, out in Arizona, maybe, or New Mexico. Uh, you know, places you can still find it on the Raton Pass line or somewhere, you know. 
that you might still see these things. But that's what they are, is inductors for intermittent automatic train stop systems. So that kind of is a segue for us talking about PTC. We'll just touch on it. It's a big subject. You could have a whole talk just on PTC, but the RSAI Act, Railway Safety Improvement Act of 2008, required that railroads uh, install PTC by the end of 2015. Uh, any railroads hauling, and, and for lines that were hazmat or passenger. And railroads did a lot of posturing to, uh, you know, figure out what lines were going to be PTC lines and which were not. Um, groups were, it was just the biggest effort. I've heard it compared to the conversion of steam to diesel. Okay. Railroads had to convene all these industry groups to work out all the details for interoperability because all of, the biggest thing is all this stuff had to be interoperable. You know, the BN engines had to be able to operate on NS and vice versa, UP and CSX and the Canadians and everybody. I mean, Canadians had to do it too for where their lines are operating here. They didn't do it up in Canada, but they had to do it for their American lines. And so all the stuff had to be interoperable. All the stuff on board had to be, which meant the stuff all on the wayside had to be, all the stuff had to be interoperable. So uh, just a huge effort, you know, I think the price tag, I think it was 20, I wanna say $20 billion. Yeah, I mean, that may not be right. Huge price tag on NS, I think it was between one and 2 billion. Might've been only 10 or 12 billion, I forget anyway. What I shouldn't be quoting that because I don't remember the exact cost of what it was for everybody, but huge cost anyway. Um, and uh, you know, it was just a big effort to make it work. It's really, it's really kind of amazing what they did. Just take the issue of the radios. The radio that was that's used on locomotives for PTC did not exist in 2008. I know, I know the Congress ladies said that it existed. I know they all thought it was off the shelf, but it wasn't. Okay, that radio had to be invented, and the industry all got together, wrote specifications, picked out a vendor and got it built and got it done, got it working, got it debugged, got it reliable. Everything that had to be done was done. And just a lot of work by a lot of people. I can promise you, this was an un, uh, just an unprecedented effort by everybody. Uh, remarkable they got it done. And, you know, it really, from what I can see, it's a pretty darn good system. You know, I don't see the reports, but you know, I do hear out there, you know, watch trains and trackside and, you know, there's just, I don't see a lot of trains out there stop on PTC. I'm sure there's some out there, but, uh, you know, it didn't bring the railroad to a halt, mainly because there was just a lot of testing that they did before uh, bringing it up in revenue service. Um, others on this call maybe can, you know, educate me on, you know, what problems are out there. Um, I'm retired now, so uh, I certainly don't see, don't see it, you know, every day. But, uh, you know, the, it, it was there to prevent collisions. It was there to prevent, um, you know, head-on collisions, rear-end collisions, uh, open switch accidents, open hand throw switch accidents, violating the speed restrictions for permanent and temporary speed restrictions. You know, a lot of a lot of things it did. So you know, that's what is there. There's still some some things that they like to do. They like to do it. FRI I think would like to have it so. It, protects you against restrictive speed collisions too. I don't think it does that, uh, at least in not all circumstances. So what are the things the railroad would like to do? The railroad really put it in, and let's be honest, I mean, the railroad put it in to meet the mandate. The railroad didn't add a whole lot of bells and whistles to, to help do things the railroad wanted to do. So what are the, what's on the wish list of the railroads? They'd like to use it, you know, in the future, they'd like to enhance it to, you know, uh, improve asset management. So we can do a better job of knowing where our freight cars are, you know, be basically enhanced with the AEI. So instead of knowing where they are every 90 miles, like you have today with AEI, maybe you could figure out a way that let PTC uh, tell you every mile where your car freight car is at. Because some customers want to know that. Some customers are putting cellular phones on their equipment because they want to know, you know, every within five miles of where the car is at and if it's moving. So, you know, maybe PTC could be used for that. Uh, moving block capability uh, in places, high density lines like, you know, the triple track from Naperville, you know, maybe they need a moving block right there that, you know, 120, 100, 120 train a day limit, you know, or whatever it is out there is not enough. They want to run 160 trains a day. Okay. So PTC might be a way to give you moving block to close up the following up distances, the close up distances there and 
and let you increase your capacity. Okay, so PTC might do that for you. En enhanced capabilities for grade crossings. Right now, you know, you got places like Hickory, North Carolina, has 25 crossings in two and a half miles. Okay, and they got all those circuits there, all those frequencies. And the bottom line of that is that's a limit train speed because there's not enough frequencies to to let those approaches reach out as far as they need to. So PTC might be a way that you can have um, start the crossings without having to have all these frequencies on the rail. Might allow getting rid of insulated joints too. So you know there's some opportunities there. I think with some enhancements. And finally, probably the most controversial one is you know going to the single person crews and you know just like RCL operations, that's going to be a um, you know that's going to be a battle. Uh, in some places from the union standpoint. So, you know, it's gonna be argued that it's not safe to do that, but um, you gotta think about how much safety has been improved with PTC, you know, what there too, you know, some trade-offs. So that would certainly be a conversation, you know, an interesting conversation. So, but those are some of the things that I've heard that railroads would like to do, you know, if they could in the future uh, to try to, uh, you know, leverage some of the investment, the vast investments that were made um, you know, in these systems. So anyway, well, that kind of concludes it um, here, folks. And I thank everybody for their attention. Uh, I'm sorry I got into the weeds a little bit on some of this stuff. It's, per, it's kind of a dry subject for sure. And I appreciate everybody's attention. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Mike. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, excellent uh, presentation tonight. And uh, I'm sure somebody has some questions or comments. So un unmute yourself and ask away. Brian, uh, Ed Kohler from New York. Just a comment, that automatic uh, train stop uh, operation, that was uh, something that the ICC designated that every railroad should have installed on at least one div operating division back in the 1930s. So that's why you saw it all over the place. But uh, great presentation, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Anything else for our presenter tonight? Um, having been a retarder operator at Bensonville for 24 years, uh, there's a lot that I, I can talk to you about. There was a speed rail involved, a uh, segmented rail for uh, doing, for determining the speed. And then we also had a way rail that would give us four different weight settings, uh, was supposed to uh, tell the retarders what to do, but more often than not, when you've got heavy tires, you're going manual, going full pressure, or you're shutting retarders off at various points because the computers from, from when I started, when I uh, made my seniority date in October of 70, until I moved up to Portage uh, and got out of Bensonville completely, uh, those 24 years, the computers did not get any better. Uh, so, so that that said, uh, uh, it was it. Yes, you're right up spot on, and thank you. Thanks. Given what we've seen uh, in the Colonial Pipeline and the meatpacking industry in the last month, what are the uh, things that the railroads are doing to prevent a ransomware attack from a probably adversarial foreign character, we use that terminology widely, um, that would possibly bring the entire transportation network to a halt? Yeah, good question. Uh, and, and, you know, the folks in the IT department who I work with closely during my time, and I, as I said earlier, I've been gone for three years, but there, there were things that they asked us to do in the interest of security that you know you thought were ridiculous, but now looking back, for example, putting passwords on thumb drives, okay? And you would have said, man, that's so silly. You know, why are we doing this? But you know, 
that they were on the cutting edge and and I, I'm sure there's you know things that there's probably everybody would say they're not what well, you ask what are they doing and they're going to say well we're not doing enough you know um, what are the cutting edge techniques the, the bad guys are getting are getting smarter every day too so the good guys have to be smarter quicker you know is what you're up to I, I know we did a lot of things we were trying to keep people out that we were very selective about who could dial in to, let's say the process control computer at a hump yard or the dispatch computer, that we were very tightly controlled uh, of who would get in. We required them to um, whoever, if it was a for, if it was an employee of a vendor that was gonna be going in, we did a check on him. Uh, he had to comply with our, all of our strictest rules on, on authentication, uh, all of those kind of things. But, like I say, I bet I bet there's a there's been an awful lot of talk, and everybody everywhere is probably saying, you know, you know, what are we doing? We're probably not doing enough. Brian, you're talking about uh, password protected thumb drives. UP just recently uh, announced that we they, we will not be able to use thumb drives at all. That they'll disconnect them unless you have a purpose for it, so you can get a waiver. I'm not surprised because you know you can think of scenarios that people, um, that that could be compromised. I mean, how about a bad guy dropping a thumb drive that's got a virus on it out in the parking lot of a business? Okay, I don't mean to be giving ideas here, but I mean, and then somebody finds a thumb drive and says, hey, let me try this thing, you know? I mean, I, so you got, that's why you make those rules that you cannot, you cannot be too careful with this stuff now these, these days. I don't know if you're able to see the chat when when you were talking about switch tenders on the uh, Harvard sub I still have a switch tender every day it's a conductor he works. Uh, lines a couple uh, trains up to the McHenry sub and then he rides uh, works the train as a ticket collector and then he comes back in the afternoon and does the same. So it's like 1800 railroading in a, in a 21st century. And the only protection they have is some intermediate signals. So yeah. we're still doing that for metro service yeah what would it cost if i mean does anyone know what it cost to, to automate it you know that's kind of the question right well here's the thing that i was told I, our signal director who's now retired told me that they had all the signal equipment there his track couldn't provide switches and then uh now now i think that it's been so long that the signal equipment's no longer the standard so that's no good anyway a lot of issues. Sometimes the joint facility issues are, are what stops you too. We, you know, we've had towers that we couldn't get rid of for 10 years because joint facility couldn't agree with the other railroad. Right. Well, part of that too is, you know, for Union Pacific, a control point there doesn't make sense because there's no freight that runs the McHenry sub. It's mostly, you know, it's just Metro. So it's Metro to, to fund that control point for that service. Same thing. Yeah. And with uh, PTC, um, we just recently abandoned the ATS on the Harvard and Kenosha subs uh, October last year. So we were running it uh, side by side and they said that uh, they didn't really have to apply to the FRA to, to remove the ATS because it really wasn't a cab signal system like PTC is. And since it was as restrictive or less restrictive than PTC, they allowed us to abandon the ATS altogether. We're still working on the automatic train control on the Geneva sub. So what they have to do for that is uh, put um, UP when they first installed PTC, didn't put WIUs on every switch. And now they have to do that to get rid of ATC. Because as you understand, and most people on here might not know is uh, on PTC, it, it goes, it reads the block signal. And this is just kind of a general overview, but it reads the block signal. So if you have a clear block signal, PTC is going to give you a clear signal into that track. But if someone opens a switch in front of you, it's not going to know that because the last signal you went by was a clear signal. Unless there is a wayside interface unit, the WIU, which talks to the PTC system and say, hey, I'm no longer lying straight. So now UP is trying to uh, install that across the uh, ATC and CCS territories so they can abandon those older cab signal systems. Thank you, Joel, appreciate that. 
Anything else for Brian? Well, once again, uh, on our I calendar here. There was here a question is, that. You... Go ahead, Ed. I think there was a question in the chat from uh, Paul Grether. Brian, you want to check the chat and see that last question there? No, uh, yeah, it's uh, on the modern rapid transit side. Is there a lot of ATO? Any applicability on the railroads? Um, I, I, please tell uh, Paul. Tell me what it, what uh, what we're calling ATO. Automatic train operation, like the Lindenwald line. In, out of Philadelphia. Is that like a totally automated operation, like a driverless trucks analogy to railroads, or is that what we're talking about? Uh, self uh, self operating trains, but they carry a uh, an operator to uh, monitor the system. Yeah, I would I would equate that. Like I say, I think that's what Marta is. But no, to my knowledge, um, I'm not aware of anything like that on the freight on the freight side. Uh, I mean. No, not, not that I'm aware of. All right, I think we got that question answered. Anything else then? Uh, so the reminder, June 15th is our next event. It's our uh, slideshow. Uh, will take place on Tuesday, the 15th of June at 7.30 PM with five presenters, each doing uh, a 15 minute programs. A diversity of uh, 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 talent there. Uh, Ed Kohler will be there um, with his uh, program on Silverton. Mike Sosala will be doing a passenger uh, uh, from his collection of passenger train photos. Um, uh, Ron Burkhart will be showing some slides that he's taken since 1958. Uh, Rob Pfeiffer will be uh, doing a Butler-based pro program. Um, Mike Del Vecchio has a program up his sleeve as well. Did I miss anybody? There should be five there. Uh, so that's the 15th of uh, June. Uh, and then we're going to take a break, a uh, hiatus for the, um, uh, for, the, uh, for the summer. We'll meet perhaps in person in September, uh, but um, our members will, will find out and we'll send out an email as well. Um, if you are not a member of the Wisconsin chapter of the NRHS, uh, now's a great time to join. www.nrhswis.org and then just click on the little join tab and you can, you can join immediately uh, through the uh, miracle of modern technology. Uh, so on behalf of uh, the Wisconsin chapter, Brian, let me tip my hat to you, uh, say thank you and um, uh, we will uh, um, uh, encourage folks to uh, to wave their hands or uh, uh, you know give one of those little reaction things. Uh, I see some thumbs up and some hands clapping. Uh, excellent um, presentation tonight, uh, Brian. Thank you very much for uh, for sharing your your expertise and uh, your long career with us. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it myself immensely. And again, anybody have any questions? I presume they can, you know, have, would have my email address. I'll be happy to, you know, uh, expand on anything.